So, I'm Ileana Lopez Regina by birthright, Martinez Vasquez. And um, I came from Cuba, arrived in Miami, and maybe a week later went to live in the Bronx, New York. We lived in a one bedroom apartment. I, I remember that perfectly. We were like 13 people living in that one bedroom apartment. And uh, this morning I woke up reflecting upon how is it that the devil starts putting a seed in your soul? Because it's my belief that all children are born good and things happen in their life where the devil actually begins to enter. And how does he do that? Through different demons. And those demons have names. So I remember being in a car and they were driving. I must have been maybe nine. And my uncle uh, spoke about money. Well, I remember we had absolutely no money and he showed me a nickel. And he told me that that nickel was worth a lot of money, but that I didn't have it. And I immediately felt that by showing me that he was also making a point that they were in a better status and we were not in the same place. I resented that. And uh, my father, he was very much into the Santeria. He was also an alcoholic. And I remember that there were very serious fights between my mom and my dad. We end up in Miami. My, at this point, my parents, my mom left my father and I met your father. So I grew up, things happened between, I had a son. His name is Rene Lebo Martinez. It was a natural childbirth at Jackson Memorial Hospital. Not shortly afterwards, I found out that instead of being there with me while I had Renee, his father was actually with his first wife. I felt betrayed. He was a real abusive father from what she told me. So I never really had a father figure in my life, so. He was abusive verbally. He was abusive physically. I remember that one day I decided to pick Renee up, pack a bag of clothes, and just leave. Back then, my mom, my mom was young, you know, she, she had me at a young age, so my mom had an addiction. She was into that party lifestyle. It was during the time of the Mariel boat lift and the mutiny and lots of partying and lots of drugs. You know, it was the 80s in Miami, you know, the cocaine cowboy days, man. Then I go live with a cousin who has as much white powder as you can imagine. I guess it started to become an addiction. My mom, she was into this religion. It's called Santeria. Because it was handed down from my father. So we did rituals in the house. We, animals were killed. I remember being five years old and they were sacrificing chickens in the bathroom, blood everywhere. And they were pouring blood down people's heads, kids, everything, man. And I remember they came to grab me and I ran. And finally they dragged me in the bathtub. There's a goat in there. And they sacrificed the goat and, and poured the blood down my head, man. Rene was into the midst of, of this sick cycle. And they would hold spiritual masses where people would uh, call the dead. I was home alone. So I was scared because I would see demons, man. And I hear people screaming like in like like in torture, like like straight agonizing pain, like if it was the screams from hell. Things happening in the house, demons walking and, and horrible things happening. My mom was, was into the party lifestyle, so she was never really home. Addiction to drinking, addiction to drugs. You know, I would find little little bags of cocaine in her clothes as a kid growing up. I did do cocaine and that was the drug that almost destroyed me. I started to drink more. I started to dr do drugs even heavier. I took an overdose of pill that first time around. 
And again, I believe it was my son that found me in bed. What did I do? I hit the streets, man. But Rene was without his mother. Rene was without his father. And Rene now how two, had two parents that was so dysfunctional that he turned to the streets. I remember being as young as nine, 10 years old and, you know, breaking into cars already, you know, breaking into houses. I remember collecting guns. I was at home sewing and I heard it in my heart. Your son is between life and death. So I'm 14 years old, we steal this car. You know, we end up all the way in Hialeah. We was from Flagler by, by Kinlock Park. On our way back, we catch a medley all the way back down. Next thing you know, the lights turn on. We get on a high speed chase. We're doing speeds of like over 100. We wasn't even thinking about it. We just flying through red lights. Next thing you know, man, I wake up three weeks later from a coma in a hospital. Almost died, man. I had a 5% chance of living. So when we crashed, the man we hit died. The phone rang. It was Jackson Memorial Hospital to notify me that my son was in a coma and might not survive that night. We had to get airlifted. The man died. My mom got on her knees in front of the bed. Now, mind you, my mom had never prayed, but she got on her knees in front of the bed and she, she said, Take everything that I have away. But give me my son's life back. I guess I bargained with God. Wake up from that coma. I'm hanging by pins in my legs. My bones are all broken, my face was all sliced up. And now they take the pins out of my legs and then they put me in a full body cast from the chest down. When they took the body cast off, I had to learn how to walk again. I'm in a wheelchair. You would have thought I learned my lesson. But no, man, I didn't learn my lesson. Started walking, back. I started walking again. Got right back into the streets, man. I'm stealing cars again, breaking into houses. I remember I had a 300Z Datsun. I had forgotten to pay the insurance because I was at the hospital. It was stolen and my home was foreclosed. Now, Renee Martinez and myself and our dog, King, go and become homeless. We live in the back of a video store now. At that point, I became so emotionally depressed that I was not able to get up from bed. I was not able to open the video store. She hadn't paid rent there for like a year and a half probably. I don't know how she never got evicted. I don't know how they did not evict us. That's the way we lived. I would have to go rob to eat because there was no food. There was no money. I was 15 years old. I had a nine millimeter 17 shot. Man, I laid fools down, man, gunpoint, man. Let me get that. I was hungry. You know, I would have to eat out of dumpsters. And I remember one night, uh, Rene had a, a, a verbal problem with one of his friends who came to the video. And I don't remember what kind of gun it was, but Rene took that gun and he put it to his friend's head. He almost killed him. I ran and grabbed a Glock that was stashed. And now we're fighting, we fighting over the gun. I had another homeboy of mine that was there and he's grabbing my hand, we're fighting over the gun. My mom's grabbing my hand. The gun went off. Bam, 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 bam. Bullets ricocheting all over the video store. So I remember I'm out one night. Sometimes I wouldn't come home for days, weeks. I'll be with the homies kicking it, gang banging. And I wrote a letter asking Jesus, well, you did this for me once before with, with my son. This time I'm gonna ask you, because I'm taking my life. I get back to the video store, my mama got her wrist sliced open and she's overdosed on pills. She tried to commit suicide. After about five years of not really being in touch with my sister, separated from her, one day I went to a friend's uh, house. She invited me to visit with a, her aunt. And uh, while they were talking there, I overheard them mention Jesus Christ. But all of a sudden I felt my sister's name real heavy heavy in my heart and I, I felt like I had, I had never felt that before and so I asked her I go uh, Jesus Christ uh, you're saying that you think he can do something to help me with her, my sister and I wrote a letter that Renee had read personally telling him all the void in my heart everything that I needed everything that had happened how sorry I was about being such an imperfect mother. I said, but one more time, if you are real, 
bring me my sister back. Bring me my mother back. For a second time in his life, Rene finds me, saves my life. But what was happening simultaneously was that my sister, who had not read that letter, who had not spoken to me for years, saw a vision. I had this power, this voice speaking to me from inside, from within me, to go see my sister. She saw Jesus Christ pull me from a hole in the ground. Well, when I got out of the car, I was attacked. Uh, I felt like fiery arrows were coming at me. Uh, and I just asked God, protect me, Lord, protect me. As I'm knocking on the door, I start to receive a vision. The door was transformed. I would see a dune, like a sand dune, almost like a desert. And then before me stood who I believed was Christ. He was covered with his shawl or mantle. I really couldn't see his face, but then all of a sudden I saw him reach down like into the dirt, into the earth, and basically pull up my sister. And the moment he went to hand her to me, she had the face of death. When I saw my sister, all we could do was hug and cry. And I didn't know what else to say to her, but God sent me here. So at that moment, I went in and we sat down and she says, I'm going to show you a letter I wrote a few days ago to the Lord, just crying from the depths of my heart. My aunt takes my mom to a retreat and my mom, and, and that one weekend, my mom stopped smoking weed, stopped smoking cigarettes, stopped snorting cocaine and stopped drinking alcohol, which she was an alcoholic, man. I grew up seeing my mom drunk her whole life, man. God is real, he really changed her. She tells me then that she's gonna be evicted within two weeks. My sister did not know how she was going to help me. This video story was crazy, man. There was graffiti everywhere inside, graffiti in the walls inside, all the movies were broken. It was straight like hell. It was horrible. It was like we were living in hell. Little statues everywhere with witchcraft and, and bells and all that craziness, man. If I gave you a description of the movies that were left, they were ready to be junked. So a man comes to the door. He never entered the video. And he says to my sister, Myra, you know, it's not a matter of whether I want to buy any of these videos or not, because God has sent me here. But with that little money that, that he gave for the movies that were basically junk, I began a new life. She bought a little car and got a little spot on uh, West Flagler, which eventually became the, the Syndicate Triangle. We left with nothing, no money. Renee had no shoes. The shoes on his feet, the soles were flapping. You know, my mom's doing better, she's going to school. But for me, it was too late, man. All I ever knew was the streets, man. I grew up on the streets, man. I remember that Rene was already in his teens. And boy, at this, this is after the accident. He really got heavily, heavily gang involved. And anger, anger, because I believe the demon that he had on him was the demon of anger. And possessed by that demon, that demon of rage, man, that anger, that that gang demon, you feel me? That that murderous demon, that revengeful demon, the demon of hate, that all oh, had a legion in him. Sometimes when he was so angry, I remember I would look at his eyes and uh, he, he wasn't looking at you. It was like if he was in a daze some, somewhere else, but not on this earth. When Rene was in these backyard fights, there's one particular fight that I saw that same look. We caused havoc in the streets in Dade County, man. And that anger created the monster that he became, ultimately then, the leader of the Latin syndicates in Miami, Florida, because it fed him, it fed his soul, and it was backed up by the demon that Satan sent. She knew that if he pulled her out of the pit that she was in, 
he was going to pull him out too. She knew it. Because he also, I mean, from all the accidents and all the shootings and all the, all the stuff that he went through, God protected him. I don't know if my words are profound enough to, to give the, the details of the intensity of the dangers that I faced, that my son faced of the strength of the prayers that I did together with my sisters and my brothers from church that saved Renee. I'm heavy into gang banging, you know? I had a bunch of homies, we ended up forming our own clique. I guess they were going out there to, uh, to fight rivals. He was arrested and placed in juvenile hall and charged with attempted murder. I felt so powerless was when Renee was sitting where the people sit that are in jail and you're sitting just listening to what's going on, especially when you have no money. And we had no money. We were counting on a public defender. So they're trying to charge me as an adult. My mom's begging the judge. I don't know why that man listened to me. They sent me out to a juvenile facility, a program better outlook center. This is what I want to do. I want to work with kids like this. But most of all, I want to learn how to get my son out of the gangs. It just got crazier and crazier, you know, like I started doing savage stuff. They had an arsenal of guns. And we was going rolling on our enemies, man, putting in work, man. I was 17 years old and my mom found a big trunk I had all the guns. We packed all those guns and we threw them in the ocean. The following day, the police raided my house. They looked everywhere. Had those guns been in there, Renee would have been doing time for a long time. He moved out the way, I grazed his chin. He was strapped. They have pointed a gun and shot at him and that bullet has gone straight through the side of him, never hitting him. And all. Uh, so many close encounters I had with death. I think this night was even worse than the first night because I had in my heart the need to surrender his life to Jesus Christ. Wasn't supposed to make it, but God said no. I'm full of scars everywhere, man. All my bones have been broken. I've been beat down with bad stab, left to die, and vice versa, man. And I'm still here, man. One night, I was awoken while I was asleep at two o'clock in the morning while we were living in a second floor in what he calls the triangle. I walked out the front door and Renee was there and he was getting ready to have it, nuke it out with somebody. But when I looked to a wall that was to his left, it was invisible to him. I saw a young kid pointing a gun directly at my son's way. I flew down those stairs, and when my son and the kid with the gun saw me, everything dissipated. You know, we started robbing drug dealers. We started we started robbing the dope boys, man. I'm talking about no mercy, man. Lay them down, tie them up, take all the drugs, dip. I started calling around 30,000, 40,000. Man, it's a society, man. I was. I don't remember what the charge was because he had so many charges, but this one was very serious. There's no way I could come up with this type of money. I called one attorney, Thomas Payne. Well, I guess he jumped on the floor and rolled all over the floor. And I'm about like 20 feet away from him. So and I'm shooting right at him. So I thought I killed him. I said, Mr. Payne, my son is charged with this. I don't have any money. I hope you can help me. He says, give me $3,000 and I'll take your case on. So, you know, I'm in and out of jail. I'm gang banging. Homeboys are dying left and right. Now I'm in jail again. I'm out of jail. More homeboys dead. People going to prison. It was a mess, homie. Many of Renee's friends have died. A handful have survived. And where's everybody else at? They in prison. My brother, little Tony, he's paralyzed. He got shot up. Tony is in a wheelchair. Pablo went to jail. I think he wasn't even 20 yet. When my daughter was born, I saw her take her first breath, man. Wow. 
Something I'll never forget, man. Trying to do the right thing for my daughter. And I was a real good dad always, man. I always had my baby with me. And, um, you know, that devil is a lie. He kept dragging me right back in, man. You know, people from my past kept showing up, so I had to lay a couple fools out. And then eventually I just got, I was all in again and not even noticing, you know, that I could have died or gone to prison for life not thinking it's like now it's like fast forward 2004 i believe and um i got introduced to the bare knuckle fight one of my homies started fighting for kimbo slice so he told me yo i'm fighting with this cat that we seen on a dvd because we have seen a dvd of him fighting he told me he made like two thousand dollars i'm like man put me down let me show them what i got homie so show sure enough he puts me down i show up i fight the karate man Knocked him out of seven seconds. A couple months later, they bring me a dude, big dude, 6'3", like 250. And I mean, we had an all out war. We fought like 27 minutes, I believe, the fight was. And we was just toe to toe, blow for blow. It was a battle, it was a war. I ended up winning the, winning the fight. And uh, I won the fight. And uh, man, I don't know, they, the tape never appeared. I don't know what happened to the tape. They cuffed it for some reason. I don't know what the reason is. They say they can't find it, but. So fast forward, I link up with the homie Dada, right? And, and Dada tells me, yo, I'm gonna start doing the fights over here in Piran. Uh, you wanna start, I said, man, Dada, put me down. Let's do this, my brother. So we started, I started fighting in Dada's backyard, man. You know, I was winning. Um, name got so big, thousands of people come to the yard to watch me to fight. Name got so big that Telemundo came La Doctora Polo came and, and she watched me fight and she's like, we want to follow you. We want to do a story on your life. Next thing you know, probably like fast forward three months later, she tells me, have you ever thought of going pro? I got a surprise for you. I got a surprise for you, level. We want you to fight professional. I was like, man, I never thought about fighting pro. Are you serious? I said, man, I'm with it. Let's do it. She got me the training at MMA Masters. I started training. I started fighting. I was fighting here, fighting there. Ended up flying to Nicaragua. I ended up fighting three-time world champion Ricardo Mayorga, boxing legend. Man, I finished him in one minute and 30 seconds, man. It was a blessing, but you know what? I was still empty inside, man. And on top of that, I was doing this gangster music. I would do gangster music, and, and like I said, my whole life, Ever since I was a kid, I was I was controlled by demons. The day that my mom, the day that my mom sacrificed the animal over my head, I started seeing demons. I would have horrible nightmares. I would I would see them walking around the house. It was crazy, man, crazy. So pretty much my whole life, I was possessed by a demon. It was a it was a giant demon. It was my mom's even seen him. I'm a triple OG. Now come and see me. So I was doing gangster music, and you know, I'm fighting, and you know, I had the money, the fame, I had all that, man, but I was empty inside, man, and I was mad at the world, man, I didn't know no better, man, I was just, I was, I was blind, man, and yeah, man, that night, I remember I was in the studio, I was writing gangster lyrics. And I remember I was it was it was in a garage. And I remember that demon overcame my body. And the darkness was over my head and I was like, man, what is this? The air got thick and I, I started feeling weird, right? And um, I heard God speak to me. And he told me, either you come to me now or I'm gonna take my hedge of protection off of you and Satan's gonna do what he gotta do with you. And right then and there, and that one second, my whole life flashed before my eyes and I realized that all them times that I survived all that, all the times I was half dead in the hospital, the time that the gun jammed in my face, the time that the bullet grazed my head, the time that the bullet whistled by my ear, the time that they shot at me and they were aiming right at me, but the bullets never hit me like I had a shield in front of me. Every time I got shot at, never got hit. I realized God had a force field around me. God spared me for such a time as this, man. And I remember, so when I surrendered 
I ended up meeting my brother Andy Rebirth, man. He reached out to me on, on social media because uh, he had he had just came out of prison and he had heard one of my songs and he reached out to me and he was like, you know, he's like, bro, what's up, man? You know, my name is Andy Rebirth. I just got out of prison and uh, I want to do this music for the Lord, man. I'm on fire for God. And, you know, at that time, King Carter had just got killed. A little young kid that got killed due to a drive-by over here in Miami-Dade. And, bro, it hurt me so bad. But I said, man, all these kids, all these babies dying out here due to stray bullets and all this craziness that's going on. So I started this event called Peace in the Hood. And uh, I asked him if he wanted to be part of it. And sure enough, my brother Andy flew down from New Orleans and we started Peace in the Hood, man. We was out there, you know, we did our first event in uh, Woodbound up there by uh, Carroll City. Now I go from prison to prison, project to project, preaching repentance and remission of sins in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, man. And man, I'm telling you, God is so real. If God did this for me, he could do this for anybody, man. It don't matter where you came from, where you, who you are, it don't matter nothing. I'm telling you, God is real and he's raising up a remnant of end time warriors that are unashamed of the gospel and that are unashamed to represent his name. God chose the low things of the world, the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, man. And I'm telling you, God is real. If he did this for me, he could do this for anybody, man. Trust me, man. I was the worst of the worst, man. I was the leader of one of the biggest gangs in Dade County, man. But now God is using me to build the tabernacle of God and man. And what God called me to do, man. That's why he put me through that fire. You know, he put me through that fire to, to refine and purify me. He shaped and molded me. And I'm still getting shaped and molded. And I'm coming out pure as gold, man. You know, and God lined me up, man. He lined me up. And now he gave me a beautiful wife. I baptized her in the name of Jesus Christ. I baptized my mother in the name of Jesus Christ, man. My mother. My mother, man, she acknowledged him as the one true living God, man. It is a blessing. Yes. It's a blessing. My mom yes. prayed for me all those years when I was on the streets gang banging. I almost died so many times. And now I'm here fulfilling the word of God in her life, baptizing her in the name of Jesus Christ. And now my son is teaching me. God is good. God is real. Yes. God is real. Amen. Amen. I no longer feel good. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I just want to thank the Lord. I want to thank you, Lord Father. I receive you, Father. Lord, I thank you because you gave me my son. You gave him his life. You listened to all my prayers. Yes. Father, you forgave my sins. And you gave me the compassion to see women who were like me and to love them. Because it's you, Lord. But most of all, Father, tonight I thank you. Because my son is baptizing me in your name, Father. And I thank you, Father. Because I don't know why you deserve this special grace, this special blessing. But whatever you ask me to do, Father, I will do it and I bless you.